Section 5.7. In the previous section, we developed what will be the key idea that drives our methodology in this chapter. That idea is, of course, that the building blocks of the solutions of the system x prime equals ax, where x prime and x are vectors, the solutions of that system are built out of eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the matrix A. That is the core idea, as I said, that motivates and dictates all of the methodology that we use in this chapter. Now, exactly how do we build the general solution from those building blocks? Well, that's going to depend on the nature of those eigenvalues. Intuitively, it makes sense that we'll have to treat eigenvalues differently if they're, say, distinct real numbers versus if we have an eigenvalue that's repeated versus if we have eigenvalues that are complex. The good news is, is that we're quite familiar with these three cases, and actually the way that we modify our techniques to accommodate each of these three possibilities will be very, very similar to chapter three. Just a case in point, just sort of foreshadow what we'll see over these next couple sections. If we have a repeated eigenvalue, then we will multiply the associated solution by t. Um, in, in the case of a repeated eigenvalue, it's a little bit more subtle, more complicated than simply multiplying directly by t. But this method of multiplying by t when one of the roots is repeated feels very natural to us now, having done that repeatedly throughout chapter 3. Similarly, in chapter 3, if we had complex solutions to our characteristic polynomial, then we expected the resulting, to, the resulting solutions to involve sine and cosine. The same will be true here. If our eigenvalues are complex, the resulting solutions will involve sine and cosine. Exactly how that plays out is complicated. And so what we'll do is spend one section each on these three specific cases over the next three sections. This particular section, we start with the most straightforward, the case where we have real distinct eigenvalues. Now, if you think back to the end of the previous lecture, I got ahead of myself a little bit and I went ahead and worked through a full example. Specifically, we had the system x prime equals this coefficient matrix times x, and we found the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of that matrix, and we used them to build this general solution. And the way that we built this general solution was real direct. The eigenvalues, negative 2 and 5, end up up here in the exponent of the exponential, and then the corresponding eigenvectors act as a coefficient vector on that exponential function. That methodology is exactly what we'll use anytime all of my eigenvalues are real and distinct. And I do mean any time. So that methodology can be applied when I have any number of equations and dependent variables in my solution in my system. So in this particular case that we worked through last time, we had two differential equations, x1 prime and x2 prime, and we had two dependent variables, x1 and x2. But this methodology that we demonstrated in this example can be applied to a system with three equations and three dependent variables, or four equations and four dependent variables, and any number. I've tried to state that general fact here as theorem one, um, and I've, I'm supposing that we have an n by n matrix A. So this is my coefficient matrix, which is square. It has n rows and n columns. And if that matrix has exactly n distinct eigenvalues, and all of those eigenvalues are real. So that is eliminating the possibility of any complex eigenvalues, and it's also eliminating the possibility of any of those eigenvalues being repeated are having a multiplicity of two or three. And what I've done is I've sort of spelled out all of these ingredients. I will admit that the notation here is a little daunting. Um, I've got n eigenvalues, which I've labeled lambda one through lambda n, and then I have the associated eigenvectors, which in the last lecture we called these this eta variable. So this is eta one, which is a vector eta two up through eta n. Then, the system of differential equations given here is x prime equals ax will have this general solution. If you're anything like me, I, I kind of look at an equation like this and my eyes kind of gloss over a little bit because there's so many variables and they're all so strange. But basically this is saying that we can take 
our eigenvalues, put them in the exponent of the exponential, multiply by the associated eigenvector, add a unknown constant as a coefficient so that I can incorporate initial conditions if they're provided, and then do that as many times as I need to. So I just reiterate that this will only work if all of my eigenvalues are distinct, none are repeated, and if all of my eigenvalues are real. In the next two sections, we'll look at the cases where we have repeated eigenvalues, and then the case where we have complex eigenvalues. But if I'm in this situation here, where I've got all distinct real eigenvalues, I can build my sol general solution in a pretty direct way. Well, the point of this section is to state and understand this result, and so, I guess we're done with this lecture. Um, well, we could be, but I would like to go ahead and work through a few examples just to get some more practice with this technique and also to work examples that kind of have extra details that we haven't uh, encountered yet. So let's uh, go ahead and take a look at a few examples. In example one, we're given a two by two system and we're also given initial conditions that we should incorporate after we found the general solution. Just to tie this into the various notations that we have for this type of problem, let me go ahead and write this same system using the vector and matrix notation. So this problem is exactly equivalent to us being asked to solve, oops, uh, this system of differential equations, where I've got x prime equals ax, and the a here is my coefficient matrix. And as we've stated in the last section and, the, and at the beginning of this section, this will boil down to identifying the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of this coefficient matrix A. And this is becoming a familiar process for us. We start by solving this equation, zero equals the determinant of A minus lambda I. This will yield the, this, uh, this determinant portion over here is called the characteristic polynomial of this matrix. And then once I've solved this equation, as I have here, then I will have my eigenvalues, which appear to be negative one and six for this matrix. Now to build the general solution, I'll need to find the corresponding eigenvectors and then put them together using the method that we have described so far in this section. So let's calculate those eigenvectors. So it appears for the eigenvalue lambda equals negative one, I have a corresponding eigenvector of negative one, one. I'll just remind you that, of course, any scalar multiple times this eigenvector is also an eigenvector. So if I preferred to write this as negative two, two, that would work. If I would prefer to write it as four, negative four, that would also work. Uh, let's go ahead and move on and solve for the other eigenvector associated with lambda equals six. And here's a case where I actually choose something um, besides just sort of one here. So I think if I've done the, the work correctly, my eigenvector should have the form, I can pick any value I want for the second component, and then the first component will be four thirds times that second component. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of fractions myself, and so uh, in order to kind of clear this fraction, I've chosen a to two to be three, and then that will yield a first component here of four. So again, this is kind of just an example of where utilizing the fact that any scalar multiple of this vector is still an eigenvector just helps clean things up a little bit. Now, based on these ingredients, I can write my general solution. So I get this general solution here, where I've simply put the eigenvalues in the exponent of the exponential, multiplied by the associated eigenvector as kind of a coefficient, and then included an unknown coefficient here, C1. And then I do that with each of the eigenvalue eigenvector pairs, and this gives me my general solution. In the previous example that we've seen, this is where we stopped. In this particular example, if we look back up at the statement of the problem, we're also provided with these initial conditions. We're told that the function x1 when t equals zero, that function should equal one, and the same is true for the function x2. So looking at my general solution here, let's think about how we can incorporate those initial conditions. 
and one method is to split up the two separate functions. So again, it kind of looks like I just have a single function here, but as I pointed out in the last example of the last lecture, you can take this vector form of the solution and break it down row by row to identify explicitly the two separate functions that we have here. Here, I've uh, written those two separate functions up here in orange. And again, just to clarify, uh, to build these or to sort of extract these from this vector form, I just imagine pushing this scalar into the vector. And then this function is acting like a scalar as well. So it could get pushed in or, or multiplied in to each component of this vector. And then I just look across these two vectors and I just grab the, the, the values that are in that first component. So here I have negative C1 times e to the negative t, which gives me this here. And then 4C2 e to the 6t, which gives me this here. And then I build the second function x2 by identifying the ingredients in the second row. Now these initial conditions make perfect sense. This says if you plug t equals 0 into this first function, we want that to come amounts to the value of 1, and the same needs to be true for the second equation. Let me go ahead and plug those t values in. And then that yields a little system in terms of c1 and c2. So I now have a system of linear equations, just an algebraic system, that I'll need to solve in order to be able to identify the specific values of c1 and c2. This is very similar to when we incorporated initial conditions into our solutions back in chapter 3. And doing a little algebra, I'm able to pretty directly identify my C1 and C2 values. Now if I plug those in to my general solution, I will have the actual solution for this initial value problem. So this is the solution that not only solves my system of differential equations, but also incorporates the given initial conditions. Hopefully you'd agree that that wasn't too bad and that process was uh, pretty straightforward. So let's go ahead and take a look at another example. In example two, uh, I have another initial value problem where I have a system of differential equations and uh, initial condition or initial conditions. And this particular system has already been presented in vector matrix form. And of course, the detail that jumps out at me is that this is now a three by three coefficient matrix. So that means we have three equations, each one containing a derivative along with three dependent variables. And as I mentioned earlier, though, uh, this methodology of finding eigenvectors and eigenvalues and then using those to construct a general solution works no matter what size our system is. So I should be able to proceed with essentially the same steps, the same process that we have in the previous example. Before I start, I have written the system in kind of the equation and variable form up here for reference, but hopefully you kind of, you, you, you see already, you're comfortable already seeing how these two representations are equivalent. Now let's go ahead and get started. And to do so, I'll have to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix. So I've started working through the steps to find the eigenvalues. I just want to pause for a sec and double check all of this is making sense. I've got to find the determinant of a minus lambda i. So I've subtracted lambda along the diagonal of my original matrix. Now this is a three by three matrix. So in order to calculate this determinant, what I'm accustomed to do, doing is using the process of cofactor expansion. And that involves selecting a row or column to serve as coefficients. I have picked the first row here. So I've taken this first entry, negative four minus lambda. That becomes a coefficient on two by two matrices, matrix, matrices, determinant. And I believe that this is the resulting two by two matrix. And then this coefficient of four, I have to force it to be negative because you'll remember that I alternate signs on these terms. So this first term has a positive sign associated with it, which doesn't change the sign of the term itself. This second term would have a negative sign associated. This third term would have a positive sign. 
Um, so since this second one's negative, that's why I have a negative there. And then I've left off the zero because it'll be zero times the determinant. And so that zero will cancel it out. And then as I've started working through the algebra here, I know that this is going to be a cubic or a third degree polynomial. So I just wanted to point out that there's often a little trick or something that'll, that'll enable us to solve this more efficiently. In this particular case, when I had evaluated all these determinants, I noticed that there was a negative 4 minus lambda multiplied in this first pair of terms. And in this second pair of terms, I also have a negative 4 minus lambda. So I factored that all the way out, and then that left me with these quantities in here. Uh, I've still got a few steps to go, so let me go ahead and crank through the remaining steps to be able to find these eigenvalues. So working through the final steps, I've finally been able to identify my eigenvalues, and as I hoped, I have three distinct real eigenvalues, lambda equals negative 4, lambda equals 0, lambda equals negative 6. So now we should be able to use our usual technique to find the corresponding eigenvectors. For my first eigenvalue of negative 4, it looks like I've got a corresponding eigenvector of negative 1, 0, 1. Let me go ahead and just repeat that process for the other two eigenvalues. Okay, I have carefully worked through all of the details. And as always, I hope that you have worked through all of this on your own, and so you can double check that I've done everything correctly here. I've kind of color-coded my eigenvalue, eigenvector pairs. And I do want to just point out that I'm, I'm doing a lot of the matrix steps pretty quickly and without, at this point, I'm not labeling the exact operations that I'm performing. But hopefully you're comfortable with this process of uh, starting like with this system, for example, and getting all the way over to this simplified or reduced form and then extracting the values or extracting the actual solution from that. So anyways, as I said, I'm, I'm, at this point, I'm kind of working through these pretty quickly without going into a lot of detail. If you do have any questions about this procedure, don't hesitate to send me an email or visit Office Hours and we can talk through uh, any number of examples to make sure you're clear on how this works. Okay, so I've got all of my ingredients here. I've got three distinct eigenvalues and I've got the associated eigenvectors. Let me scroll down to give myself a little bit of room and I will put all of this together to write my general solution. Okay, so using my standard procedure here, I have built uh, this general solution. Notice I've actually written e to the zero t, but of course that's just one, so that wouldn't actually be included. I just wrote it to be kind of consistent. Now, I have an initial condition, and then just to refer to what that looks like in my the original statement of my problem, notice that it's given as a vector here. So let's look at my vector form of the general solution and see if we can make sense of this. Looking at this here, I know that the x, the zero is this, will be plugged in for this t value. So I can imagine plugging t equals zero into each of these, and that effectively makes all of those exponentials just become one. And so then the given initial condition vector will equal c1 times this, c2 times this, c3 times this vector. And that leads directly to a system that we will solve for c1, c2, and c3. So let me show you how I'd write that. So this is what that initially looks like when I've plugged in t equals 0 into these exponentials. So I just have coefficients times these vectors. Now this is exactly the system of linear equations, the algebraic system, that would enable me to solve for c1, c2, c3. And the way I would typically do that is to use the augmented matrix representation. So that would look like this. And now I simply need to do the algebra or linear algebra, the matrix operations to reduce this system in order to solve for the C1, C2, and C3. 
For the take, sake of uh, time and space, I'm going to kind of utilize um, some assistance there. So let me just go ahead and write the reduced form of this augmented matrix. So performing the necessary matrix operations, I think I get this reduced system here. And then again, these values are exactly the values for C1, C2, and C3. So it looks like C1 equals negative 1, C2 equals 1 fourth, and C3 equals negative 1 fourth. Now I can plug those into my general solution, and I'll finally have my final actual solution for this initial value problem. So my final solution solution looks like this here. And just to just point out one little detail, I mean, this does look pretty complicated and there's a bunch of vectors and functions, but if we were to break this down row by row, um, I mean, we've got a lot of zeros. So for example, the x1 function, if I was to look at just the first row of this solution, x1 is simply e to the 4t. X2 is a little bit more complicated, you know, and X3, but um, I just point that out because I, looking at the, this structure, looking at the this form with vectors and functions, to, to me is a little daunting, but I just like to remind myself that there are some basic functions kind of lying at the heart of this solution. Okay, so we were able to handle a three by three system using the same techniques that we had applied to a two by two system. And the next example, things are a little bit different. And this example is a demonstration of how differential equations, which are not initially systems of differential equations, can be converted into systems of differential equations. This is a very common technique and it is actually applied in lots of different scenarios. So these matrix uh, eigenvector eigenvalue techniques actually can be useful beyond problems that are initially stated as systems of differential equations. And example three here gives us one specific instance demonstrating how this plays out.